I want to thank Shi Hong Lin, Chair of the Organizing Committee, and everyone who has helped organize this series of webinars. Participants are all muted, but we encourage you to put questions during the session into the Q&A box on the bottom of your screen. Today's webinar was organized and moderated by De Deborah Shri, Ray, Assistant Professor of Epidemiology from Johns Hopkins University, Bloomsburg School of Public Health. She will introduce the speakers and moderate the Q&A at the end of the session. And I will now turn the podium over to Deborah Shea. Thank you. Thank you, James. Um, welcome everyone to today's seminar. We have two great speakers lined up. Um, first, you know, Dr. Priya Duggal is going to speak. So Priya Duggal is an associate professor of epidemiology and international health at Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. She's also the director of the genetic epidemiology program within the Department of Epidemiology. Her group is focused on global adult and pediatric populations uh, in an effort to identify host genes associated with severity and susceptibility to different parasitic infections and how these may be altered by the environment and other host factors like sex and malnutrition. So it is my pleasure to introduce Priya Duggal and I'll leave the floor to her to speak about her work in COVID-19 and host genetics. Thanks so much, Debashree. Um, and thank you so much for the invitation to speak today. So as you know, this is sort of a tag team on the start and I'm gonna be talking about the host side of things. Um, and then um, shortly thereafter, Dr. Chimp will be talking about the viral side. So one of the questions that I'm often asked because my research focuses specifically on host genetics and infectious diseases is why we would even consider genetics in the study of infectious diseases. And I think that's an important question, one I've had to answer a lot. And I think during this pandemic, it's been a little bit more obvious why perhaps host genetics might play a role. But just to get us on the same page, um, the real idea behind this is that if we can understand why people have different outcomes, we're gonna better understand the immune response. And that's really our whole entire goal is to better understand the immune response so we can exploit it. We can take advantage of what we know naturally is occurring um, to develop therapeutics. And really for a lot of the other diseases I study vaccines because there is no treatment. So our overall goals is to use our body to help us to develop things that will protect us. And a lot of times we think about genetics and we think about Mendelian traits or monogenic disorders where there could be a single variant that causes a disease like Tay-Sachs disease, for example. But there are also complex traits that are more common like diabetes or heart disease, obesity, asthma. And I actually think infectious diseases are the perfect example of that type of complex trait. First, you have to have exposure to a pathogen. If you don't have exposure to the pathogen, you can't have the disease itself. Second, there's a tremendous amount of redundancy and complexity of the immune system, which suggests that multiple genes are likely at play and involved in that immune response. And then third, there's actually the pathogen genetics, whether it be a virus, a bacteria, or parasite that also has genetic factors that can interact with the factors in the host or can at least alter it or, or have effect modification on, those, uh, um, on the host. And I think that's just as important, sort of highlighting how complex infectious diseases can really be. So the things we look for to see if genetics could be playing a role are really three main areas. Um, the first is disease heterogeneity. And we think about that traditionally in statistical genetics anyway, just sort of trying to explain what heterogeneity we see or do we see heterogeneity that's not explained by traditional risk factors like sex or age or comorbidities. And with infectious diseases, I can think of things like tuberculosis, right? Where a third of the world's population is actually affected with TB, but only about 10%, and that's still a huge number, are gonna develop clinical disease. What makes those 10% different than the other 90%? Or hepatitis B, where you also have a third of the world's population infected with hepatitis B, but only 10% will go on to a chronic infection. The rest will clear their infection or something like HIV AIDS, where in the pre-heart era or in the pre-treatment era, the time from HIV to AIDS was two to 26 years with a mean time of 10. And that's accounting for things like age or risk factors of exposure. So what was driving that difference or that heterogeneity? And that's really what we focus on. First, we have to find it. And then we have to say, can we explain it away by anything else? And then second, familial aggregation. 
And this is really hard to assess with sexually transmitted diseases and with respiratory or enteric infections. I mean, first, because we often look in families and we definitely don't want to see sexually transmitted diseases in a family. And it's hard when you think about something like flu or a diarrheal disease like norovirus that might have affected any one of your families, that if we see aggregation of disease or infection, that's really because of the transmission of the pathogen, not because an individual is more likely to have it due to their genetics. Not to say they couldn't, but it's hard for us to disentangle that. But there have been really beautiful twin studies that are show that monozygotic twins have greater sharing than dizygotic twins. And there have been really elegant adoption studies done in Northern Europe where you see that um, individuals who die early from infectious diseases are actually more related to their biologic parents than they are to their adoptive parents, suggesting that there is something that's going on here, a familial aggregation. And then finally, pathogen dose and environment. They really can't be major players. And I think this is the most common thing I hear, which is that it's really about the amount of pathogen you got, the amount of virus, the viral dose that you got is explaining your severity or your progression to disease. And I'll be the first to say that's 100% true that it could be that factor. But what about when it's not? And could it be something else? And one example of that really is a mistake that was made in 1926 in Lubeck, Germany. It's, the, it's one of many mistakes we've made, but it's a really tragic one where 249 babies are injected with the same live dose of tuberculosis instead of BCG. The babies were too young to have any significant prior exposure to mycobacteria, and they were not previously vaccinated to BCG. They all got the same strain, they all got the same dose, and yet 76 babies died and 173 babies survived. So even when we account for the pathogen strain, the pathogen dose, we still see heterogeneity or difference in disease. And I think that opens its gateway to why infectious diseases um, could be driven by host genetics. So we're driven by two main questions. Do you get infected and do you get disease? There are tons of other questions that I'll follow up with on what we should be looking at in host genetics as well. But these are our two main ones that we sort of think about. But the one thing that sets infectious diseases apart from other chronic infections like obesity or asthma is exposure. It's just simply that, right? So we're gonna talk about exposure later, but the real take home point on it is you must be exposed to that particular virus or pathogen for you to have that disease. So that brings us to COVID-19. We've learned a lot in almost one year of really studying COVID-19. Um, and one of the things we've learned is that these are the typical presentations of COVID-19 for a disease I say that doesn't actually seem so typical at times, right? So with almost all infectious diseases, we have an asymptomatic group, um, individuals that we don't even think about, or it's hard for us to study unless we have really great cohorts where people actually just don't have any symptoms. We often have individuals who have mild infections, and we see that with COVID right now, where some people have flu-like symptoms or um, diarrheal disease or um, vomiting or other factors that, um, that incapacitate them for a short period of time. And then of course we have individuals who need to be hospitalized where they have disease progression that requires they be monitored in an ICU or need mechanical ventilation of some sort. Um, and some of them actually have different organs that are affected as well, including the heart or the kidney or the lungs. We also have more rare syndromes like the multi-inflammatory syndrome that affects children or MISC and MIS-A because we've seen some of the same symptoms in adults where you actually have multiple organs that are affected. Um, many of these kids do recover, but they have some lasting damage and it doesn't occur during the symptomatic phase. It occurs actually post that symptomatic phase by several weeks. And then more recently, we've really been able to highlight how many individuals actually have post-acute symptoms or what we call long haulers. So we're doing a study here in Baltimore where we're enrolling ambulatory patients that tested positive at Johns Hopkins. And in that group, 20 to 30% of them identified and who tested positive in March and April are actually saying that they have long hauler symptoms. So it's pretty, pretty prevalent overall. And that can range from having still no sense of taste or smell six to eight months, months post their infection, or it could be as much as them um, actually having ground glass opacities on a lung CT and actually needing some real help. So there's a huge amount of variety and heterogeneity, not only in your presentation of COVID-19, but even within these categories. And I highlight here 
the asymptomatic and mild infections, because I think that this is the one that took us a little bit by surprise where asymptoma asymptomatic individuals may be shedding um, longer. Um, they actually may have a weaker immune response um, and some actually have organ involvement with no actual symptoms. And so this complicates things a little bit more for us as we start to think about the biology of what's occurring, even if you're an asymptomatic infection, because often we've treated asymptomatic infections as really not having an infection or in some cases not colonizing something. What do we know are the risk factors for severe disease? It's the same that we've known since January of last year in the, one of the original papers published in JAMA, older age, male sex, and comorbidities. All three are major risk factors for why someone has a severe outcome with COVID-19. And yet we know that there are older people, even people in their hundreds who've recovered from COVID-19. So age is not the only factor that's driving this. And of course, younger people have required mechanical ventilation and even several have died with no comorbidities. A lot of people have argued that race appears to be a risk factor. And I'd argue that it's definitely a social risk factor, but it's a measurement of something else um, that's not biologic. And it reflects a lot about what's going on with regards to who gets infected, who gets exposed, um, and that we have to consider. And then of course, for a long time, I've had the privilege of saying that viral genetics does not seem to play a role in severity of disease. And I've always said yet, and I think now we've reached that point where viral genetics, and we'll hear more about them, actually is playing a role or could play a larger role. And so what will that interaction be between the virus and the host? And so all of this, when we think about the usual suspects, everything that's happening, is there a place for host genetics? And of course, I'd argue yes. And I think there are two ways we can consider it. One is, do you get infected? And that's asking a question about susceptibility. So this actually requires detailed information about the population under study. We need to know that individuals who were not infected, in some cases we'd call them controls, were actually exposed and yet they still didn't get infected. Otherwise, what are we looking for, right? If we're calling something that you're more susceptible because you have a genetic variant, everyone has to have been exposed to, in this case, COVID-19. The focus of this type of study design is really on highly exposed individuals where you can document or you can actually infer that an individual was exposed. So in this case, you could think of us doing studies in healthcare workers, um, in first responders, in um, individuals that work in the grocery stores where there'd be lots of exposure. You can also think about household members of known cases where you actually know that a household member comes back into the house and is positive and has the opportunity to expose people in their households. And then this is more like the way we do say HIV or STD research where we follow people at high risk um, because of their behavior. So you could also think of perhaps a group of college kids that have reunited on campus um, and are holding parties off campus which just shut down Hopkins for two days, for example, um, because of those behaviors. That's a way for us to get at this question of susceptibility. I'm just gonna sort of say right now, there are lots of studies claiming that they're looking at genetic susceptibility and there's yet one to be designed and published or um, talked about that's actually looking at susceptibility. So we have to be a little bit careful about what we're hearing is happening. What's much more common is asking this question about disease severity. And this is really about the heterogeneity in the disease that I just highlighted for you. In this case, we can select cases and controls from among individuals who all have the infection. So we're looking at anyone who tests positive for COVID-19, and we have sort of a distribution of different phenotypes that we can sample on or on the extremes. And the reason that this is really important that we include everyone that was exposed and had COVID-19 is because we need to compare a severe case to someone who actually had the opportunity to become a severe case. If I compare a severe case to someone who never had that opportunity, I don't really know what that other person would have become. Right? So that an example of that is comparing severe cases to people who've had the luxury and privilege of sitting at home through the, the pandemic and haven't had contacts with other people. With no exposure, we don't actually know what would happen to you. So there are two sort of traditional ways that we could approach this. One is the rare disease approach, which is family-based or multiple effectives with rare outcomes. And we could do exome, um, whole exome or um, whole genome sequencing. And another approach is doing the common disease approach where we could use genome-wide association methods, whether it be array-based or exome sequencing or potentially whole genome sequencing. 
So here's a paper that was published in JAMA earlier this year that takes the rare approach. This is actually where they sampled on two young men in a family that both needed to be hospitalized because of their specific um, outcome to COVID-19. So that's actually pretty rare. We don't actually see multiple family members of a young age that need it. We've seen older ages. And these individuals also didn't have a tremendous amount of comorbidities that were associated with them. So the question is, why were they there? And they found a second family that also met the same criteria of two boys. So cutting to the chase, they identify um, a rare mutation in TLR7, which is located on the X chromosome, that they believe is part of, they know is part of the interferon pathway. And so this paper hypothesizes sort of a root of trans, a root of um, genetics playing a role using these rare individuals. We haven't seen replication because no one's actually designed a similar study looking at young um, siblings in a, in a pedigree that both needed to be hospitalized, likely because we just don't see it. So this is very much in line with traditional genetic approaches of sort of saying, can I use these rare outcomes to sort of inform us about what might be happening biologically? And I think it's a good example of what we could learn from it and perhaps think about treatments or therapeutics based on it. This is another study led by Jean-Laurent Casanova and Hinton colleagues, where they tested this hypothesis that SARS-CoV-2 infection um, could be done to monogenic inborn errors of immunity. And what they identify is in about 650 patients um, of different ancestries ranging from one month to 99 years of age is that there is an enrichment at 13 loci that are immune related and previously implicated in influenza severity. And so they see more mutations along this group of genes than they do in the, in the overall genome. And then and as they do in, in comparison to what they would see normally. Unfortunately, this particular study has not been replicated. Regeneron tried to replicate this and was unable to replicate or see that enrichment. There is functional evidence to support this pathway. Um, it's true that these people have these loss of function variants here. So it's very possible that again, a highlight on the interferon pathway may be very relevant and important. It's just hard for us to see it on a population scale. And then of course there's genome-wide association studies that can be done with COVID-19 and there've been several, um, not all that have been published yet. Um, the first is the Ellinghouse paper that was published in the New England Journal of Medicine and I'll highlight that in one moment. There's also Ken Bailey's paper that was recently published in Nature and there's a paper by 23andMe and Ancestry.com. But I'm gonna highlight the last three in a global consortium um, versus on the specific papers. So this is um, the first paper that was published, and I think a lot of credit needs to go to this group um, in Europe that was able to get samples, genotype them, and publish a paper by June of, of 2020. Pretty phenomenal at how much work had to go in to make this happen. What they did is they took hospitalized COVID positive cases. There were about 835 Italian and 775 Spanish individuals, and they compared them to population-based blood donors or healthy volunteers. We'll talk about that in one moment, but for those of you not as familiar with the Manhattan plot, that's what you're looking at here on the, in the bottom. Um, it's called the Manhattan plot because we're looking for skyscrapers to come up all the way across our image. Um, on the X axis are actually our chromosomes starting from one and going to X and Y. Each dot represents um, a test of significance for a specific single nucleotide variant or a genetic variant, usually by chi-square. And you see on the Y axis, the minus log P value. So the higher it is, is the more significant, and that's what we're looking for, those peaks. So you see one here on chromosome nine at the ABO locus. This got a lot of attention, a lot of attitude of is ABO driving these differences that we see? Are people who are blood group A or B or O more at risk or protected? Um, I'm not sure that's panned out, but this got a lot of attention. And then this region on chromosome three that you're gonna hear quite a bit about or see in a few minutes with a series of genes, none of which have yet been identified as being the variant or the genes, but this region seems to be um, popping up multiple times. So I just want you to think about everything that I just said, which is that we should be looking at hospitalized COVID cases and maybe comparing them to other people who had COVID. Um, if we're trying to think about disease severity. And in this case, they use population-based blood donors who tend to be younger. We have no information on comorbidities or treatment for the cases or the controls. And so it just sort of begs the question of what research question were they asking when they looked at this? There's a big assumption here, right? That in the population, anybody who would have been exposed would have actually not been hospitalized or the number would have been small enough that you wouldn't be concerned about it. 
And that seems to be repetitive. So um, really great um, consortium was built by Mark Daly and Andre Ghana from the Broad Institute where they actually just created this entire um, resource where um, people that really had skills and interests, specifically statistical geneticists, could come together and think about the questions you could ask on host genetics. And it's populated with data that individuals are bringing to the table, but really anyone can participate in this. Um, and these are their most latest results. And I'm gonna walk you through each of these figures relatively quickly. So the first one in the left corner is very severe respiratory COVID-19 positive individuals versus not hospitalized COVID-19 individuals. So you've got really severe patients versus people who didn't need to get hospitalized. And I just walked you through what a Manhattan plot was. I didn't mention that these lines of significance, and in this case, this purple line right here, are actually your thresholds of significance that are adjusted for multiple comparisons. So you want us to go above that threshold for us to believe that it's real. And in this case, nothing reaches genome-wide significance. And one could ask why, why is that true? This is our best case to look at these severe cases versus population-based controls. And what you see here is there's only 269 cases and 688 controls that contribute to the study, all of whom are from European cohorts. So I think this is a sample size issue. The second one we can look at is the one right below it, where it's very severe COVID-19 versus population controls. Very similar to what Ken Bailey's paper asked that I don't highlight here, but this severe question of if you've got really, really severe people and I compare them to the population. And you can see in that figure, there were lots of um, peaks, including chromosome three. And I just wanna highlight the distribution of um, what we're looking at. So we've got 5,000 cases um, and we have one over 1 million controls. And that's because things like 23andMe are contributing 680,000 controls and 495 cases, or the UK Biobank contributing 328,000 controls, but 309 cases. So there's quite a bit of imbalance between who's a case, what, you know, what the contribution is for a case and what that contribution is for a control. But we are seeing in this case, this chromosome three region and other regions that have emerged. But again, I ask, what does it mean to be a population control? The next one we can look at is hospitalized COVID individuals versus not hospitalized COVID. And this is actually 4,000 cases and 11,000 controls. Um, so again, at least we're on the spectrum of individuals who are COVID positive. And it's really great to see that this chromosome three region that was originally identified is the one region that's still there. And then finally, this is um, hospitalized COVID individuals of any sort versus the population. And again, you can see um, the, the difference in um, cases and controls with something like FinGen contributing 100 cases, but 238,000 controls. Um, in this case, we have about 10,000 cases and over 1.8 million controls in the study. And these are the regions that are identified. So I think our money is on looking at these ones up here. That's where, the, that's where we're going to have a real understanding of what's happening. So these are really interesting findings, especially chromosome three. Um, as I mentioned already, what does it actually mean? I think we have to get at that still. Um, and then that we don't really answer this question about COVID-19 susceptibility, although many people have phrased COVID positive versus COVID negative as susceptibility. And that's just not true. It needs to be people you know were negative, but exposed. I also didn't exactly highlight, but nearly every single study contributed is European. So um, we are not seeing a, any diversity in the studies that are happening. And yet we know this virus has affected the entire world. And so it is actually exceptionally disappointing to see that we aren't seeing studies from other countries that have emerged. And so of course, what do we need? We need diverse and representative samples, but we also need to understand who's testing positive and why they're testing positive. So we know social and structural issues are playing just because you're hospitalized doesn't mean that there's something biologically for the reason that you were there. So in the last minute, let me just tell you what we're doing at Johns Hopkins. Um, we're actually um, enrolling um, individuals who are ambulatory, so who tested positive but didn't need to be hospitalized. We're also enrolling um, individuals who are hospitalized and we have them all being genotyped at the Center for Inherited Disease Research. We're looking at increasing diversity because we're in Baltimore, so we have an ability to look at um, other populations, including Black and Hispanic populations, looking at severity of infection, like I just discussed, but in light of the comorbidities and exposure, because we're able to capture that through our questionnaires. Um, looking at cytokine response, um, antibody response with two of our colleagues, Andrea Cox and Chris Heaney, and looking at long-term outcomes, so these long haulers that we've identified in our ambulatory patients.
but there are lots of questions we should be asking. So things about what makes individuals who have the rare outcomes different, as I already mentioned, the cytokine and inflammatory markers, um, pharmacogenetics, there's questions about how you respond to a trial, associations with humoral and T-cell immunity, and then of course, linking genes in with genetics. But the most important one I really think has always been host pathogen interaction. And what will the variants that we're identifying, how will that differ when they face humans? We see this in other diseases like hepatitis, where it does have an impact. And so we're, we're looking forward to seeing how we can collaborate more. So in sum, we need careful and comprehensive characterization of both infection and disease. We cannot treat any case as just a simple case, but most importantly, we can't treat controls the same as we used to. It really matters that we think about exposure. And of course, existing resources like biobanks or case control studies and cohorts cannot often be used in this scenario because we don't have this type of information available in them. We do in some, but not in a lot. So this is our team, the genes and ID team. Um, and we also have a COVID gene study. This is what we were talking about. And this COVID long study that's looking at long haulers. If any of you have had COVID, please go to covid-long.com and fill out our survey. We're just trying to assess the number of people who have COVID in the country. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Dougal for this enlightening talk. And we have our second speaker now. Uh, we will be taking in questions at the end of you know, uh, the second talk. Um, so Dr. Winston Timp is an assistant professor, associate professor of biomedical engineering at Johns Hopkins University. Um, he and his lab uh, you know, is focused on the development and application of sequencing technologies in order to gain a better understanding of biology and a more accurate set of clinical tools for human diseases so that they can apply their tool sets to clinical samples for the diagnosis, surveillance, and treatment of human diseases. Without further ado, I leave the floor to Dr. Tim. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Ray. Uh, so um, uh, I'm gonna to talk to you guys today about, uh, so uh, Dr. Dougal just told you about uh, things from the host side. I'm gonna take over and talk about things from the virus side. So first, um, let me say, there's lots of different kinds of viruses. A lot of what I'm going to talk about today is generally applicable to many different viruses. And, and you should not just think about it in the context of our particular pandemic, but also think about it in the context of other, both respiratory and, and, and other viruses that are occurring. And some of the examples I'll provide are going to be about uh, general uh, viruses. Um, viruses are classified using uh, the Baltimore virus classification system on the molecular level based on what kind of nucleic acid they have and how the nucleic acid is translated. So for example, influenza or flu is a so-called type five virus, which it means that it has um, negative strand RNA as, as, as what's actually in the virus itself, which then gets uh, translated to mRNA. SARS-CoV-2, uh, uh, which causes COVID-19, uh, is a type four virus, meaning that the virus is transmitted, it's an RNA virus, it has a positive stranded genome, which then gets converted to negative stranded and then gets translated to mRNA. Um, positive stranded viruses are especially concerning because you don't necessarily, you could translate directly to protein from the genome itself. You don't even necessarily need to transcribe it to new RNAs. Uh, this doesn't happen most of the time. Most of the time you're expressing specific mRNAs because you want amplification, but, but it, it is a, a, a special concern, especially when dealing with it in terms of the safety protocols. Um, you know, we all know about uh, uh, COVID-19, but there's actually many different coronaviruses that affect humans. You probably haven't even heard of these four, uh, OC43, HKU1, 229E, and, and NL63. These are pretty mild coronaviruses that cause, uh, it's estimated on the order of 15% of the common cold. You probably have heard of these other three, uh, uh, SARS uh, uh, coronavirus, or AKA SARS, uh, which came in 2003, made a big splash on the world stage, but was pretty well confined uh, within uh, Eastern Asia, and specifically China. Um, uh, infected something like 8,000 people with a case fatality rate of 10%. So it was serious, but uh, it was detectable and it was confined and, and uh, due, to, due to strong efforts by public health uh, authorities. There's also MERS or Middle East Respiratory uh, uh, Syndrome, uh, which is another type of coronavirus. It, it sort of came uh, on the scene in 2012. They've had about 2,500 cases with a very high case fatality rate, but 
Uh, for whatever reason, it hasn't spread very much. It's still active in the Middle East. There occasionally are cases that crop up, but it's not as active as our, our, our friend here, uh, SARS-CoV-2, which I don't even have the total case number listed there because it changes so rapidly, uh, sadly. What does a coronavirus look like? Well, it, it's called a coronavirus because it has this sort of corona of, of these spike glycoproteins, these sort of yellow guys that are all surrounded around here. And I also have, if you can see me, I have a little uh, plushie, you know, capitalism is an amazing thing. These were made by March, you could buy these. Uh, uh, and um, so you have these little spike proteins, the RNA is contained within the capsid, you have the, the envelope and you have these also HE, uh, uh, gluten and esterase dimers here. The spike is important as you can, might imagine because that's what's uh, felt by uh, the host environment. And so it becomes important uh, as you'll see later for thinking about immunity, but um, we care generally about the entire structure of the virus. How does the virus actually get into the host cells? Um, so it's thought that this is the major process uh, through other studies in, in coronaviruses and through studies that have actively been done like as we speak on SARS-CoV-2 where uh, the spike protein uh, 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 and the virus comes down, it binds to this uh, uh, receptor ACE2 uh, along with Tempris2, enters the cell, the RNA is released, um, it generates these uh, helicase and re replicase transcriptase complexes, RDRP, to make yet more RNA and to make the low proteins, to make the spike protein, to make the, the envelope protein that form the virus, it gets packaged up in the, in the host cell's own Golgi apparatus, and then leaves the cell, it, it, and then it, it uh, leaves and goes out and infects other cells. And this is how it sort of spreads. Um, I want to reveal, I want to tell you about this sort of amazing fact that uh, you know the, the first cases of 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 of, uh, of SARS-CoV-2, the first cases of COVID-19, were in 2019, at the end of 2019, like November, December. Um, we had a complete genome for this coronavirus published, like publicly available. This is on Virological, which is a common um, uh, virus uh, uh, virology forum. Uh, in, on January 10th, like less than two months after the first case was reported. Uh, this is incredible. Te five years ago, 10 years ago, this would not have been possible because of the state of sort of technology and the state of things. But, but now uh, we got the genome incredibly rapidly. And this will become important as I tell you later for some of the work that's being done on vaccines. But it's also important for testing. As a result of this, people were able to design uh, PCR tests and, and other tests to look for the virus in different patients. And, and, and yes, it's clear that some of, some of that response has been fumbled uh, depending on, 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 on different uh, locations. But it's also clear that we had this capability because uh, um, these guys, uh, 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 Yongshan, publish the data freely and accessibly so that everybody could see what the coronavirus genome looked like. This is what it looks like. It's about 30,000 bases long uh, of RNA. Uh, it's T's here instead of U's. Anybody can download it. It's available on GenBank at NCBI. You can just go look at, at what the genome looks like. This is what the structure of the genome looks like. So as I said, it's about 30,000 bases long. It's a positive stranded uh, uh, virus. It's a polyadenylate virus, which means it has a bunch of A's on the end. So it looks like a, a, a normal mammalian mRNA. Um, it has 13 different open reading frames. There's 13 different things that get translated uh, to, to different proteins. They have you know, these non-structural proteins in this first ORF. They have this spike uh, a protein, which again is sort of very important. And a lot of attention is focused there. The envelope proteins, other accessory proteins, et cetera. How was this genome actually generated? Well, the first thing that people had to do, we didn't know what the genome was. So they had to sort of assemble it. So they took samples from somebody who was infected, who displayed the etiology of, of having COVID-19. And they sequenced all of their RNA. Uh, and then they, they found, they got rid of all the human reads, boring in this case, sorry, uh, Freya. Uh, and they instead looked at uh, reads that seemed to be viral in origin, and then they reassembled it, stitching it back together. So the reads that they were using were short sequencing reads, aluminum sequencing reads. And so they took these different reads and they were able to look for overlaps and stitch it back together, sort of like a jigsaw puzzle. The bigger the pieces, the easier the puzzle it is. There's actually a lot of tools to do this nowadays, canoe, spades, mega hit, et cetera, to actually reassemble um, from small fragments of, of cDNA, you know, converted complementary DNA, back to the full uh, uh, RNA genome. 
using this genome, they, they were able to compare it to other uh, known information about viruses, especially bat viruses, which is how they've sort of come to the conclusion that they, and this is the paper published uh, by, by those guys, where they say they sort of came to the conclusion that it's most similar to other bat coronaviruses, suggesting that it probably uh, came uh, from, from that area. Now, there were other competing uh, discussions about this, but again, this is all possible because we were able to generate that genome sequence and analyze it and look for uh, um, uh, um, homology between the different genomes that are available. So what do, we, what do we want to do with this? Now, we have the genome, but we don't want to just look at that one genome and say, oh, we're done. You know, we can test that. Viruses mutate. It's important to, to keep up with the virus and, and figure out how it's changing over time and, and to identify what, what's going on with the different cases. And importantly, to see, do different viruses, do viruses with slightly different nucleotide sequences uh, have an impact on, on what's happening to, to, to different patients? And so we leveraged work by the Arctic Network, including Rambo, uh, Goodfellow, Loman, and Rowe, you, where we use two pools of tiled uh, PCR amplicons uh, um, that go that spread all the way across the SARS-CoV-2 genome, sort of shown here uh, with these little red lines, it's pool one and pool two, um, using 98 primers in two different pools. Uh, this is originally the sort of work by this is, is available on the internet with the with the sequences you need to generate these these amplicons publicly available. A lot of the world is using these sort of amplicons to sequence virus. And then uh, the original paper used on how you design such things is available in, in Nature Protocols. So we, we established the sequencing capacity here at Hopkins uh, uh, in early March. So we could actually start to sequence some of the positive samples in, in the controls uh, uh, through. And then we expanded that capacity in April. And uh, um, more recently in the, in the late fall, uh, Dr. Heaven Mustafa in, in the Hopkins Pathology Lab pictured here has been pushing very hard on, on continuing and keeping up with sequencing of some of the samples and, and uh, has been uh, looking at a lot of the cases that we're receiving here at Hopkins. So what else can we do with that? Well, if you have the different sequences of the virus, you can actually compare the sequences to generate what's called phylogenetic trees. Uh, what do I mean by that? Well, what happens is you look for, if you have, let's say these five different sequences of virus, A, B, C, D, E, and you compare them all to each other, you can see that like A and B seem identical, even down to the base level. Now this isn't shocking because the virus actually frankly doesn't mutate that rapidly as I'll get to a little bit later. In contrast, uh, virus C here doesn't have this green mutation, but it does have this little red mutation. So it's the, the, the nearest common ancestor here is this orange one where they had the orange and blue mutation. So you can actually generate a tree and you can try and trace how this virus may have evolved and where, where it sort of came from. Now, you're limited by your sampling. So if you've missed an extra sample, then you might not know that there was a different sort of shape that the tree could take. But given the constraints of the sampling and the virus sequences we have, we can still sort of trace where the virus is coming from, how it's spreading, and, and, and going from location to location. A uh, sort of a uh, very interesting example of this was done way back in 2014, the before times, uh, on Ebola. And so th uh, this is uh, a, a link, as you can see, by um, uh, um, to Virological again, where they were tracing using the viral phylogeny tree here, and the time at which uh, the samples were taken, they could sort of trace the movement of Ebola uh, here in Africa uh, so they could figure out where things were coming up. It also allows it to them, uh, it's useful for public health authorities because then they can figure out, okay, well, how is this transmission happening? Oh, it's, you know, it's this truck that's going between these two villages, which is helping to, to spread out because you can figure out the source of, of, of it by using uh, the viral mutation, by, by trying to cluster the viruses, by trying to generate these phylogenetic trees. Similar work has been done uh, uh, for SARS-CoV-2. This is a, a picture that I generated way back in April of the early spread of the virus from China. And you can see that uh, you know, the US was, was infected both uh, from uh, Europe and uh, uh, from East Asia at sort of roughly the same time, if we're looking at uh, on a monthly time scale here. And you can see, you can watch the different viruses sort of traveling back and forth uh, uh, between uh, different locations. We also work to try and correlate this with um, patient phenotype and comorbidities and patient outcomes. So uh, uh, Dr. Dougal was talking a lot about uh, uh, trying to understand uh, what does it mean? You know, what, 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 how is it associated with comorbidities? What genes and the host are playing a role? We wanted to look to see, well, is it, uh, do certain mutations in the virus uh, provide uh, uh, an advantage or make the virus uh, sort of more likely to generate severe cases? 
Uh, in our preliminary analysis back in, in sort of the summer now, uh, we did not find that to be the case. We found that different clades, different mutations of the viruses shown in this tree up above, didn't weren't significantly associated with with um, with certain with outcome with like whether they ended up on the respirator, with whether they had severe disease, or whether they were sort of ambulatory and able to leave. We also didn't see that, uh, at least in in our initial data, that. Uh, certain comorbidities gave them a greater chance for getting a certain type of virus. Like certain types of virus didn't seem to infect people of either a different racial background, different sex, or different comorbidities. Sure, people of certain sex or race or comorbidities did seem to get more severe disease or, or acquire uh, SARS-CoV-2 easier, but it didn't seem to depend on what the viral sequence was, if that makes sense. So the current phylogeny, the virus looks something like this, if you're looking at a sort of on uh, on the current kind of worldwide scale. I would I would direct your attention to this website called nextstrain.org. It's sort of very fun to play around with because it, it, it accesses the publicly available data from uh, Gizade and, and you can look at and manipulate the different, the trees to, to analyze the data in different ways. I wanna direct your attention to three specific uh, variants here. The so-called South African variant here, B1351, uh, the sort of orange right here, the so-called Brazilian variant or P1 and the UK variant, uh, B117. Uh, two points about these. Uh, you notice that they're sort of a little further out on this uh, um, uh, tree. So the tree, the further you are from the origin represents the number of mutations you have since that original viral sequence that was published back in January, uh, so-called Wuhan 1. Uh, and you can see that most of the time we're sort of slowly stepping out with this virus where it's going, you know, little, little steps. But, but the, the UK variant has this long arm. It's sort of like a big branch sticking out from a bush. Uh, it seemed to have acquired a relatively large number of mutations before it was really detected and has generally more mutations uh, than the, the rest. Uh, the Brazilian variant, again, also has, seems to stand out from the others in terms of the number of mutations. South African variant, slightly less so, but definitely has uh, a lot of mutations here. The important thing about these three variants of concern uh, one, the B117 variant seems to be more transmissible. Uh, um, it, this is a, a, a sort of table generated by Eric Topol, uh, um, where he, he posted on Twitter, and I thought it was a nice summary, where you can sort of look at the fact that the B117 seems to be significantly more transmissible, both based on some preliminary uh, molecular biology data, and also based on looking at the epidemiology of how it's spreading and how we seem to see more cases of it over time. In contrast, the South African and Brazilian variants don't necessarily seem to show that same thing, but they, but perhaps more worryingly, they do seem to show uh, uh, less response from from either convalescent serum, from from serum derived from people who have previously already had COVID, and even from uh, uh, people who, even from monoclonal antibodies that are directed against some of the spike proteins and other things. So we're worried that some of the mutations that are acquired, especially some of the mutations acquired in the spike. Uh, um, uh, uh, protein, maybe maybe causing uh, some level of immune escape. It's not yet like complete, and we don't have enough information about whether people who have some immunity still can avoid severe disease. Uh, we know that some of the vaccines still still the vaccines still provide some of the vaccines we have data on seem to indicate that we still get resistance, partial resistance um, to the South African variant and the Brazilian variant, but they are concerning. And they are things that people are watching and are, are worried about. Um, as I said, so the original uh, clades of virus that we see, uh, that we originally saw in, in uh, developed in East Asia uh, back in late 2019, early 2020, were largely displaced in favor of some of these newer clades, like 20A, 20B, 20C. These are next strain clades. Um, we think that this is largely due, uh, the community seems to believe that this is largely due to sampling effects as opposed to and different efficiencies of non-pharmaceutical interventions, AKA, you know, how well people were social distancing, wearing masks, et cetera. And so that was preventing the spread of some of these. And then some of these uh, uh, sort of won, but it was more of a founder effect issue. It was more that, that this virus landed in a place where there was fruitful ground, where, where people weren't obeying uh, uh, social distancing mandates. And so we're able to engender sort of super spreader events and get a lot of virus going. In contrast, B117 seems to be surging upward at a rate that is uh, uh, pretty high, suggesting uh, higher transmissibility. Uh, and it seems to be displacing a lot of the other variants that were occurring uh, in the UK. Um, Importantly, the community, the viral community, the viral genomic community seems to expect that with the vaccine-based selective pressure that we're going, hopefully, are all going to have very soon, 
that we might see more changes in the clades. We might see mutations that are occurring to the virus uh, in favor of, uh, of, of viruses that can escape or at least partially escape the vaccine. And so it's going to be really important that we step up our efforts to, to keep tabs on the virus, to keep sequencing the virus, to see what different uh, variants are emerging. But the good news is that the mutation rate generally of the virus, even including uh, uh, the UK variant sort of shown, shown here in this orange color, is pretty slow. So this solid line here shows the mutation rate that's estimated for SARS-CoV-2 as, as around 23 substitutions per site per year. You can see that, that for example, uh, our friend, uh, the UK variant B117 is higher than that. But this dotted line represents the rate of mutation that's estimated for uh, H3N2 uh, influenza A. And you can see that the flu mutates way faster than this. You know, I, I know we're all familiar that the flu vaccine, you know, you need to have it every year. And sometimes the flu vaccine is only so on target, but that's because the flu is mutates like mad. It's, it's very rapid uh, um, compared to SARS-CoV-2, which has a relatively, at least currently, uh, reasonable mutation rate. So we may be able to keep ahead of it. And the really exciting part about all this is that because of the sequence information we have from the virus, we can rapidly design vaccines. The mRNA vaccines that, that some of you may have heard of and some, some of us lucky few may, may even have already gotten an mRNA vaccine from either Pfizer or Moderna, these vaccines were designed basically in a weekend back in March because they had the viral genome sequence, they had the spike sequence, the, the, the basic science going into making vaccines like this has been going on for 10 or 15 years. So we are now at a point, amazingly at a point in, in, in scientific technology and in, in viral science where we can design a vaccine, uh, we can generate the sequence for the virus and design a vaccine like that. Now production isn't easy, testing for efficacy isn't easy, testing for safety isn't easy, and I'm not downplaying any of that, but it's amazing that we'll be able to do that. And what it's, and, uh, uh, basically, all that was used, so Pfizer uses the entire spike sequence, just the receptor binding bind, just the place where it binds onto sort of ACE2 is used for the Moderna. Uh, they introduced mutations to try and make the protein more stable and therefore potentially have a higher Im immune impact. And you see all these little size symbols, that's because they use pseudouridine instead of normal uridine to both evade the normal innate immune response and to improve the translation rate in the cell. But the point of all of this is that that also means we might be able to adapt the vaccine pretty rapidly. And people at Moderna and Pfizer are already talking about how they might want to try and do that. And, and, and the important thing is going to be to pair closely to the regulatory agencies to figure out what's going to be needed for safety and efficacy testing to be able to potentially get a booster uh, uh, for new strains of this. And, and just think of, of how we might be able to apply this to other respiratory diseases that, that are, are so troublesome. Yes, we had a good flu year because the flu, uh, um, uh, the RT for flu is, is so much relatively lower than, than uh, uh, coronavirus, but wouldn't it be nice if we could also have a, a, a rapidly targeted effective vaccine for flu like this? Uh, I don't know enough about the vaccine science personally. I'm, I'm a sequencing guy to know how possible that's going to be, but but the potential for it is tantalizing. And so uh, with that, I want to acknowledge all the people at Hopkins who have, uh, I worked with uh, on this project, especially uh, uh, Peter Thillian and, and, and Shirley Wool uh, um, from APL and the School of Public Health, respectively, uh, and Heaven Mustafa and Stu Ray. Uh, from the School of Medicine. Uh, Heba is, is sequencing like mad in the Pathology Center as we speak. Uh, and, and Stu is, has been uh, you know, a, a, a force uh, to help with the virology the entire time. And of course, uh, uh, sort of the global partners, uh, including NextStrain, who are, are doing an amazing job uh, organizing and, and representing and, and investigating this data and the Arctic Network who provided and, and generated and made publicly available um, some of the um, tools for this. And of course, Jazade, who actually uh, it hosts uh, sequences for, 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 for the coronavirus. Uh, with that, um, uh, I'll hand it back over to the, Dr. Ray. Thank you so much, Dr. Tim, for a wonderful talk enlightening us about the virus side of things. Um, so we have about 10 minutes, so I'll just ask a couple of questions while I'll expect you know, the attendees can type in their questions in the Q&A box. So uh, first off, you know, you talked about, um, you know, all of these new variants. So how do these variants, you know, this goes to both Dr. Dougal and Dr. Tim, you know, how do these variants you think may interact differently with the host? Um, you know, any thoughts on that perspective on that? Korea, do you want to, do you want me to take it? I'll, I can take it from the virus side really quickly. <laughs> 
Okay, sure. Um, uh, so one of the variants, uh, 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 so-called Nelly, which is a, an N to Y mutation, uh, increases the binding affinity. It's in the receptor binding domain and increases the strength of binding to the ACE receptor. So you can imagine that, that some of the variants uh, uh, might affect the ability of the virus to bind and therefore enter the cells. Uh, I, would, I would, of course, see to, to my colleague, uh, Dr. Dugo, about how variations in the virus might then pair to variations on the host side to be able to enter the virus more carefully. But you can imagine that either stabilizing the virus itself or mutating to either evade the immune system or get into the cell better uh, would be uh, uh, um, selected for, let's say, in a viral population. Yeah, I, I completely agree. So we've seen it with longer, um, with with viruses that have been around a lot longer, right? That they could have pressure on the human genome. So you can imagine why specific um, viruses may interact differently with the host. In this case, it sort of since we're dealing with it in real time, live as it's happening, there's also the possibility that people have specific genetic backgrounds due to the uh, seasonal coronaviruses, especially, or others that make them more or less susceptible. Um, and then as the virus mutates, that changes it. And, and a lot of it is gonna be this binding on the spike protein. I think that's going to the question of susceptibility, which is why we really should be designing those types of studies and following people at high risk. Um, or at least doing household studies. So Dr. Dougal, um, are there like uh, limitations or limiters for having, you know, uh, you know, these GWAS studies that you talk about move forward, you know, the genetic stu studies, host genetics? Yeah, so it's been pretty amazing, I have to say, having been in the genetics field for so long, that to see how quickly things have come together and how people really feel a need to move things forward. I think some of the limitations really are how we're, as we talk, as I talked about, how we're identifying cases and controls and making sure that we're really answering the scientific question we want to answer, not just providing answers to a different question. And then the biggest, the other one that's I think really, really important is diversity. You know, it, it doesn't really make sense at this point that we don't have more diverse populations represented. And genetics suffers from this all the time. But in the middle of this pandemic, I, I would hope that we could um, move better to, to have more diversity. Those are the two biggest things on just the host side. And uh, we have a question from the audience. Um, are the current vaccines effective against the current mutations of the virus, especially the spike protein mutations N501Y and E484K? Yeah, I, I just typed an answer to that. I, I can say that there's a, a preprint out um, uh, from Pfizer, uh, among others, where they they tried to look at this in, in vitro and they found that that there, there still seemed to be uh, sort of neutralizing titer for that. Um, some of the other tests, including Johnson & Johnson and others have shown that um, it, it does still have effect, efficacy, although reduced efficacy against uh, N501Y and, and other mutations. Uh, as muta I, I, I have trouble uh, being able to answer the, the earlier question on, on um, the, the, the K mutation because it, you know, we have to do the study to answer the question. I'm not aware of a study yet that has looked at that specific mutation. And so we have to go through and study and look at combinations of the mutations as well to see if they're playing a role. So uh, it's hard to say. I think we always should remember that there's a polyclonal response, right? So if we give our immune system the entire spike protein, some of the time you might make an antibody against the place that the virus happened to mutate. And some of the time you might make an antibody over here, and which means that, that it's effect, you still have slight effectiveness. The key is really going to be, can we at least, at least will the current vaccines preclude severe disease and long COVID uh, so that we can, we can get somewhere? Um, and, and, and people are generating data as we speak to answer the que specific questions about the different variants. Okay, thank you. Um, so, um, Dr. Lean, our chair of this organizing committee, this webinar, um, she has asked another question. Can the current PRC tests detect the new UK, Africa, and Brazil variants? If not, are new primers needed? How to monitor these emerging new variants and possible new variants that might emerge in the US? So, uh, um, interestingly enough, um, uh, some of those variants actually have a, a dropout because there's a deletion, there's a six nucleotide deletion at, at um, amino acid 6970 in the spike protein, which means that you can actually detect the presence of, I think it's the UK variant, B117, 
uh, through a lack of response in one of the genes that the qPCR tests are, are, are targeted against. That suggests that we should potentially have more primers uh, to, to monitor some of these with better qPCR tests. We don't have to do full on sequencing constantly. Uh, we should be doing sequencing. We should be doing more sequencing. The UK is killing it with sequencing. They're doing a great job uh, keeping up with the sequencing. If you look, a lot of the sequences are from them because they've, they've set up an amazing infrastructure in partnership with the NHS to be sequencing, to be watching for this. And that's why they know about the UK variant in the first place. Uh, um, it, it's, it, we should be doing the same thing here in the US uh, um, and we should be putting energy into it. And we shouldn't just learn this lesson for COVID. We should be learning this lesson for uh, all infectious disease and be tracking that kind of thing. Um, so, sorry, long answer. Short answer is, uh, yes, they can. In some cases, they can detect it, but you may want to design new sets of primers. So she's also asked, as viral sequencing is more expensive than PRC tests, uh, so are there methods to profile the virus that are cheaper or easier than sequencing? Maybe. It's a tough question. Um, um, it, it can be done, but it's it, you, you know you can think about you know doing child qPCR. You can think about sort of PCR assays that are tweaked. Sequencing costs are also coming down and people are trying to figure out ways to do this in high throughput at, at cost. Um, so it's an active area of development. I would say probably pairing targeted qPCR assays to um, uh, uh, lower scale, but still high throughput sequencing asset, sequencing mode would be the best way to go. Okay. So given the current cost, how feasible is it to perform like you know, viral sequencing on a large scale to monitor these emerging new variants? Um, it's an infrastructure question more than anything else. It's getting the samples together, getting, getting them to the sequencer. It's not even the sequencer that's expensive, it's the preparation of the samples. So you could also envision a scenario where if we work this out, you could do, you could pool a bunch of samples. You know how they've been doing uh, a testing on uh, like sewage wastewater. You could also pool samples from an entire community, just sequence it at some depth. Uh, so you save money on the sequencing prep and then you look for variants at any frequency as opposed to looking for consensus sequence to try and figure things like that out. Um, these are all things under active development. I, I think um, uh, clearly it can be done. The UK is doing it. Uh, they're doing it at cost, they're doing it at scale. We're talking on the order of if you, you know, something like $100 a sample or, or something is, is what we're able to do it for, even at the small scale we've been doing it at Hopkins. I think we could probably drive that cost down if there was the will behind it to, to figure out ways to, to get to high throughput and use efficiencies of scale. Okay. So Dr. Dougal, would you like to answer uh, this question about thoughts on the effects of vaccine on future genetic association studies? Yes, I'm sorry, I meant to type it in and I hit the live button, but um, yeah, I think it's a really great question of what will the vaccine do for our ability to identify people who are um, hospitalized, right? It changes that severity question. Um, and that's why I think it's great that we have samples um, that so many people have collected already. But there's a separate question, which is what happens when you get the vaccine and what's your response? I think some of the biggest questions, severity was critical before we had the vaccine and we could keep you out of the hospital. The next set of questions are gonna be, how do you respond to this vaccine? Who loses their immunity? Um, in terms of their antibody response and gets more reinfected. So I think that unfortunately, there's still a lot of questions to be asked. And, and we see that, right? Six to eight months out, 70% of people have their immunity, um, their antibodies. But what about those 20 to 30% that have lost it? Um, and who are they and why have they lost it is a really big question. And it'll be just as important on the vaccine side. Another question, like how do we disentangle like social factors from you know infections when we're doing these studies? So this is a really big one and, and one that I, I probably didn't highlight enough, but all those studies that I showed you, the one thing when they looked at genetic correlations that they kept seeing was an association with education. The less educated you were, the more likely you were to have severe disease. And to me, that's a social factor. That's telling you who was exposed to the disease. And similarly with obesity and SES and so, so socioeconomic factors. And so I think there's a lot we have to ask on the epidemiologic side of who, who was at risk to get exposed because of work or finances or other, other issues, um, and therefore they were there. And can we account for them? Like these are things we can't sort of just look on the big factor of severe disease or not severe disease. We really have to think about who was at risk. Okay. 
So um, one question that's left, um, are the Pfizer and Moderna vaccines still considered the best ones to get? Any thoughts on that? I'd say the best vaccine is the one you can get. Uh, I, 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 I would not, I, I would get what vaccines you can get. You know, we, we need to go for, I mean, Priya, you know more about this than me, but I would say we need to go for herd immunity more than anything else. I'm a sequencing guy. Priya, can you say something different? Yeah, no, I, I completely agree. It's the vaccine you can get. All these vaccines are fantastic for what they were intended to do, which is to keep you out of the hospital. We don't know a lot about transmission and that's why masking and social distancing will continue to be things that we have to do. But in the meanwhile, staying out of the hospital is so important. Take a vaccine if offered, whatever vaccine it is. Okay, thank you so much, Drs. Dugal and Tim. I do not see any other open question from the attendees. Um, thank you all for attending this session today uh, with us. Um, thank you once again. Thank you. Thank you also from uh, NIST for uh, Professor Ray and these two wonderful talks by Professors Timp and Dugal. And in two weeks, we will have another session with a slightly different focus titled Misinformation and Attitude Formation Among the Canadian Public. So welcome back, look for a registration link. And thanks to Glenn Johnson, who provides technical support and will provide the video and the slides for this session on our website at nist.org news. Again, thank you all and have a good day.